Oral health is an important and growing field of science, and dental researchers and surgeons worldwide are working hard to give us all a reason to smile. Hi, I'm Mika Barem, and I recently starred in a movie called Smile, based on the real-life story of a student like you who learned about healing and caring by working with an organization called Operation Smile. Operation Smile helps children and young adults all over the world receive surgery for oral and facial deformities. This can mean the difference between a life of loneliness and pain or a life filled with smiles and health. You can become involved with Operation Smile as well, or you can choose to study oral health science and become a dental researcher like the women you will meet in this program. Whether you help people feel better because you fix their problem or use oral health science to discover new treatments for disease, your life as a dental researcher can be both challenging and rewarding. The scientists in this program have made a difference in the lives of thousands of people through their research findings and practice. Join us now for Women in Dental Research to see how and why they chose this path. Action! How would you like to investigate some of the greatest medical mysteries of the century? Doing science that makes a difference to people like you and me. Making amazing discoveries and traveling the world, sharing these discoveries with other scientists. The women we'll meet have done all this and more in laboratories and hospitals in the community and in their universities. These three dental researchers give us all something to smile about. I'm Wanda Liz, your host for Women in Dental Research, the show that takes you where science is happening. We're going on location to meet some of the top dental researchers in the country, and we'll go in live for a closer look at what makes a career in dental research so exciting. Check it out. In San Francisco, California, where a community of scientists banded together to fight an epidemic. In Chapel Hill, North Carolina, where molecular research helps us understand the mysteries of oral disease and cancer. And in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where one scientist has made groundbreaking discoveries about the link between oral health and premature births. All this and more on Women in Dental Research. As you'll find out in this program, you don't have to be a trained dentist to be an oral health researcher. But the history of dental research begins with dentists. We'll start our exploration of dental research here at the National Museum of Dentistry in Baltimore, Maryland. This was a site of the first dental college in the world, so it's a perfect place to get a little refresher on our dental history. Don't forget to floss. And now for a brief oral history. As long as we've had teeth, there have been people who've made their living working on teeth. The pharaohs of ancient Egypt had toothists. The Mayan Indians did cosmetic dentistry in 900 AD. You've heard of the traveling salesman. In the 1700s, you could be visited by the traveling dentist. No Novocaine, no drills, just this icky looking corkscrew thing, yikes. But all that changed in the 19th century when dental colleges began to open up all over the United States. Starting with this one. Dentistry was finally becoming a science-based health profession with lots of homework to prove it. Most dental colleges did not accept women, but a few did, and the first women dentists were trained. Lucy Beeman Hobbs Taylor was the first woman in America to earn a doctorate in dentistry in 1866. Ida Gray Nelson graduated as the first female African-American dentist in 1890. And Vita Latham became the first woman in history to earn both a dental degree and a medical degree in 1892. In 1918, only five women graduated from dental colleges in America. In 2001, more than 1,600 women graduated from U.S. dental schools. Many of these women went on to become leaders in the field of oral science and dental research, like our first featured scientist, clinical researcher, Dr. Deborah Greenspan. More than 25 years ago, in San Francisco, Dr. Greenspan found herself at the forefront of an epidemic which was still largely a mystery to the rest of the world. Her scientific discoveries about HIV AIDS and related illnesses changed medical history, and her safety initiatives helped transform dental practice everywhere. 
When you are treating people and they come in with a problem, what happens is you look at the problem and you run through a series of possibilities, things that you know about. And you will have at your fingertips the, the right way to go about treating it and managing it. But sometimes it isn't quite so clear. And sometimes things aren't so obvious. And sometimes things are a little different. And it is those things that set you on the path of asking, why is this different? What is it? And how do we find out what it is? As a dental researcher, Dr. Greenspan has always used her professional curiosity to uncover the mysteries of oral medicine. In the late 1970s, she was studying white spots on the tongue, commonly called thrush, when she noticed that more and more lesions had mutated in an unusual way. I was seeing something in the mouth that I had never seen before. In my field, we call white patches leukoplakia. Leuco is white, plakia means patch, and so I called it hairy leukoplakia, a hairy white patch. And we began to realize that we were looking at something that might possibly be connected with the newly recognized AIDS epidemic. An unofficial research task force, including her husband, oral pathologist Dr. John Greenspan, banded together to share knowledge and information about the newly discovered disease called AIDS. We would have people from all over San Francisco, from the different clinics that were seeing people, we'd have people from the blood banks, we had everybody who would, was coming to this meeting who were interested in uh, finding out more what are you seeing this week? What are you doing for this? How can we manage that? We were all there, all working together, all seeing patients. There were no barriers, no borders. It was the best of clinical care and the best of science. San Francisco established the model. One of Dr. Greenspan's early discoveries was that hairy leukoplakia, by now its official name, was found in those who were infected with the human immunodeficiency virus called HIV because their immune systems were compromised. The next step was discovering what virus was causing this new lesion. So understanding that we had a clinical problem, finding that it was associated with one virus, but in fact then with further research, recognizing that this was associated with a virus called Epstein-Barr virus, and this was absolutely amazingly new and unheard of. Epstein-Barr, the virus associated with mononucleosis, used to be extremely difficult to study. With the discovery of hairy leukoplakia, scientists now have ready access to obtain the virus. Dr. Greenspan had transformed oral AIDS research. Next, she helped transform the practice of dentistry itself. When scientists learned that HIV was transmitted through blood and other bodily fluids, Dr. Greenspan led a revolution at the UCSF School of Dentistry by enforcing safety regulations that are now taken for granted all over the world. Within a period of a year, we had totally changed the way we practiced dentistry in the school. From short white coats that were worn by the dental students that they took home to launder, we moved into blue gowns, dealt with the hospital laundry, masks to prevent lateral transmission, eye guard to prevent eye transmission, and gloves which we changed from every patient. Huge protests. We were asking dentists who'd never worn rubber gloves to do general dental procedures to wear rubber gloves. And anybody who now goes to the dentist today, the dentist would say, well, of course, this is how we do practice. So I really think that here in San Francisco, we were pioneers. We showed it could be done, and we showed that it could be done very quickly indeed. Despite increased knowledge and safety precautions, AIDS continued to spread internationally. It became rapidly obvious that AIDS had no borders. And we realized in the rest of the world, in um, particularly in Africa and in Thailand and in other parts of the world, AIDS suddenly took off and became a major, major problem in countries which had very little access to health care, let alone to medications. 
In developing countries such as Africa or India, the standard HIV test is too expensive or unavailable to the majority of the population. Using oral lesions, along with one or two other symptoms to suggest HIV infection, means that thousands more may be diagnosed and then sent for treatment and management of their disease. A small step in the battle against this global epidemic, but Dr. Greenspan believes that with scientists from all over the world working together, knowledge will eventually triumph. None of us are alone. We don't work in a vacuum. We can't work alone. Because you take what your problem has, you work with the first group, you work with the second group. The boundaries expand and you become an ocean of information and research. And it's the most wonderful and the most exciting thing to do. For her, it's personal a lifelong dedication born of a revolutionary time with patients who fought alongside her on the front lines of an epidemic. We didn't know what we were doing or what we were getting into or how long it would take us to get where we, we got. How fast knowledge evolved, how quickly we got to find the virus. It was just an amazing time. I still get a tear in my eye when I think of the young men and their, their attitude, their hope, um, which I think inspired us all. Dr. Greenspan's work on oral lesions was a starting point for our next dental detective who investigates down to the genetic level to find out important molecular clues about oral disease. Get ready to roll on a professional ride along with one of the leading clinical researchers in microbiology and dental health, Dr. Jennifer Webster Surak. Research is a process and we're continually building on the findings of other people. And so our okay. hope is that each contribution that we make will be something that someone else can build upon. Dr. Webster Sirach was still a dental student when she discovered the work of earlier dental researchers like Dr. Greenspan and realized there were a lot of mysteries to solve in the mouth. I got really interested in pathology and disease in dental school, but really frustrated that if you look at our pathology books, where they describe the oral diseases, many of them say etiology unknown or idiopathic, which means we don't know what causes any of them. Her interest in finding out what causes oral diseases at the molecular level brought her as a graduate student to University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, where she earned a dental degree as well as a PhD in basic science at the School of Dentistry. Today, Dr. Webster Sirach is a member of Chapel Hill's faculty, maintaining a busy schedule that strikes a perfect balance for her between the dental chair and the laboratory bench. I work in a hospital dental clinic, and this is a clinic for people who can't be seen in a regular general dental setting because they're hemophiliacs, or they have head and neck cancer, or they're going to get a transplant, or they have AIDS. And a lot of times, because of their disease or their immune suppression because of the medications that they're on, they'll develop interesting oral lesions. My research is on how those lesions develop. If we understand what they're doing, we can target them therapeutically and stop them. Dr. Webster Sirach spends several days each week practicing dentistry in the hospital and dental school, alongside residents and dental students. Sometimes she goes to the main hospital floors to treat immobile patients at their bedside. And in the afternoon, she heads to the dental clinic to see healthy patients. Her clinical work supplies her with materials to take back to the laboratory, where she spends the other days of the week in research at the bench. Well, actually, what we do is take clinical samples. So we see people in the clinic, and then we collect samples from the clinic. If we know that a person has a particular disease, we biopsy it or take a little piece of it, bring it back to the lab, and then look to see if there is a specific virus there, what genes the virus is expressing, how it's influencing the cell. Dr. Webster Sirach also spends her lab days editing and writing scientific journals, as well as meeting with other scientists to keep abreast of developments in her field. In addition to discovering genetic causes of diseases, she also works with other health professionals on oral health treatments, such as this mouth guard to deliver drugs orally. 
that's a basically a mouth guard that's impregnated with drugs so that you'll have a sustained, slow release of the drugs that's local and the person won't have to take any pills. Dr. Webster Sirac loves the challenges of her career, but she does not let work get in the way of life with her family. I have two kids and they help me maintain my perspective because if an experiment doesn't work, you know, life's going on. They help me to keep what's important at the forefront. What is important to Dr. Webster Sirac is using science to help others. I'm a people person and I enjoy working with people and helping them to feel better. And the bottom line is, people who come into the office usually feel better either because you've made them look better or gotten them out of pain. And back in the lab, she lives for discovery finding molecular clues to detect and thwart some of the most difficult diseases of our time. Well, we're making discoveries all the time. <laughs> and what's exciting is that eureka moment. I mean, you can spend a lot of time at the bench and really not learn anything new or novel, but when you find something that you think is gonna be important and make an important contribution, there's nothing like that eureka moment. It's not easy to be the dean of a major dental school and conduct groundbreaking research at the same time, but our next scientist makes it look painless. Dr. Marjorie Jeffcoat, dean of the University of Pennsylvania School of Dental Medicine, has made groundbreaking discoveries and she did it while teaching, running a dental school, and practicing dentistry. How does she do it? Let's meet her and find out. My career has always been one of balance and collaboration because that's what I love. I enjoy getting up today and saying, today we're doing research. Today I'm seeing a patient. I love that. Balance and collaboration. Dr. Marjorie Jeffcoat has plenty of both in her life. As Dean of the University of Pennsylvania School of Dental Medicine, she leads a major dental program while mentoring dental students and teaching. She works in the West Philadelphia community around the university as well, promoting public health with free dental care and education for local students. And she is a world-renowned clinical researcher, conducting clinical trials with patients and scientists to discover new dental treatments that could affect us all. This hectic balance is possible because she is part of a larger scientific community that works together and supports one another. It's very important in science. Uh, it's more and more important as every day goes on because nobody knows everything and nobody has every creative idea. You need to just be fascinated by other people's ideas and want to work with them. The location that currently people have to do. One of Dr. Jeffcoat's favorite collaborators is her husband, engineer Robert Jeffcoat, with whom she has shared more than 32 years of marriage, as well as many research projects. My husband and I have worked on a number of things through NIH grants, in fact, over the years, and that has been a wonderful part of our life. You don't have to do the same work. But don't think because you have chosen a career in science in any way, it cuts you off from a happy home life, because it does not. Together, the Jeffcoats have developed a series of new dental instruments to measure things in the mouth. One of the things I've been especially interested in doing is developing new computerized techniques that can assess x-rays that will tell you the bone density, or the amount of bone loss, or even if there's decay in a tooth. Her scientific collaboration extends beyond national borders as well. The whole world reaches out to us, we reach out to them, and it's very personal. I go to Germany in a few weeks, and then to Brazil, and I uh, have a whole schedule of places to go to present results. And in fact, you, you really do have a very exciting life and you meet people worldwide who become collaborators and friends. 
One of Dr. Jeffcoat's projects that drew international attention was her collaborative research with OBGYN doctors and pregnant women who suffer gum disease. In clinical trials, she and a team of researchers treated these women with thorough gum and tooth cleanings and discovered that in their study, the incidence of premature births decreased along with gum disease. Her work highlights the larger issue of the potentially serious effects of oral disease and infection. If you had gum disease all around your mouth, the size of the weeping wound, I know it sounds disgusting, but the size of the weeping wound, my hand's not big enough, folks, is bigger than this, if you add it all up. And you can see why that infection, if that spreads and that inflammation spreads to the rest of your body, can give you other problems. Dr. Jeffcoat has also been at the forefront of the development of a new kind of dental anesthesia. This is something that can be squirted right between the gum and the tooth. Makes the gum all numb so you can clean, you can get that whole area nice and numb without a needle. University of Pennsylvania also takes its dental health program to the south and southwest Philadelphia community it serves. The Penn Smiles Mobile Dental Van is part of a clinical study that tracks community outreach and its effect on future dental health. We actually have little dental chairs in there for children. We can take x-rays in there. Isn't that We can do educational programs in there. So we go to the children rather than expecting everybody to come to us. It is all part of her deeply held belief that dental research can make patients' lives better, whether they are pregnant mothers, adults with diabetes, or children seeing a dentist for the first time. Dental research is a wonderfully rewarding career. Dentistry is a wonderfully rewarding career. You take people who hurt, you get them out of pain, and in dental research, you try to keep them out of pain for the future. I hope you enjoyed learning about dental research as much as I did. It's a career where you can be a modern medical detective and make scientific discoveries that help us all. These women have done it. You can too, if dental research is the path for you. I'm your host, Wanda Liz. Thanks for joining us today for Women in Dental Research. Keep smiling! I hope you enjoyed the program. Coming up, here's more information for you about careers in dental research. To obtain this information firsthand, we conducted a personal interview with one of the nation's leading oral health experts. This is Dr. Dushanka Kleiman. She is a Rear Admiral in the U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps and a co-executive director of the Surgeon General's Report on Oral Health. Can you explain what the U.S. Public Health Service is and what it means to be part of it? Sure. The U.S. Public Health Service Commission Corps is one of the seven uniform services, and we report to the Surgeon General as our Commander-in-Chief. And our mission is to protect and promote the health and safety of the nations. So what kind of breakthroughs do you think we'll see in the field of dental research? Well, there's many different breakthroughs. One of them is using saliva, your spit, as a way to detect diseases and to monitor your health status. Our researchers are also working on tissue engineering, and they are mimicking nature to be able to rebuild bones, rebuild teeth, and help with wound healing damage due to disease or to injuries. Can the Public Health Service help a student like me get the training and education I need in oral science? Some of our programs for training and career development are run out of dental schools that we support. 
There are loan repayment programs because we do know loans are high in dental school nowadays. And that's special for individuals from disadvantaged backgrounds, but also people that are going to do research in specific areas, such as clinical research and pediatric research. We need you in dentistry and dental research, so I hope to see you one day, Wanda. For more information about career and educational opportunities in research, please visit these websites.